Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Dr. Jeff Show podcast. This show is available on Apple, Google, Spotify, Liftable, Edify, wherever you get your podcast. Please go there and leave a review and tell your friends about the show because this is the show where we talk with major thought leaders to show how worldview changes everything. My guest today is is an international authority on communism, fascism, global jihadism. His parents escaped from communism. And now he has come to the United States. He's worked in the White House. He has been on television. I know you're going to be familiar with his name and with his voice, but today is unique because I'm not asking our guest to talk about international relations. I'm asking him to talk about the crisis of masculinity. Please welcome Dr. Sebastian Gorka to the show. Dr. Sebastian Gorka, welcome to the Dr. Jeff Show podcast. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Uh, a lot of people in our audience know of you because of your commentary on television related to international affairs. But lately, you have been talking a lot about the masculinity crisis in the United States. And that transects with something that we've been thinking a lot he about here, which is how should we handle the whole issue of transgender from not only a personal standpoint, obviously we don't want to be bullies or you know be demeaning to people, but it, it leads back to this larger question of, you know, what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman beyond just the, the biological differences? So anyway, thanks for agreeing to come on and talk about that. You're absolutely welcome. This is a, a crucial topic. It is uh, shocking what we are witnessing. There is a denial of truth that is prima facie, that is truly cult-like, especially in its consequences. The idea that in some parts of the nation, near where I live in Washington, D.C., in Maryland and elsewhere, we have seen a 400 or 500 percent increase in juveniles saying that they are transgender, and we find out if you talk to very brave doctors like Dr. Miriam Grossman, that we find out between 60 and 80 percent of these adolescents, these teenagers, are autistic. Then there's something going on here that isn't about freedom of choice or freedom of expression. We don't allow 14 year olds to smoke or to drive cars. Why would we allow them to say, I'm not a girl, I'm a boy and I wish to have, quote unquote, top surgery to have my breast removed. This is sheer insanity and we need to stop it. This is a cult-like uh, problem and it is the denial of truth. We aren't, we aren't making fun of people. We aren't attacking individuals who have mental issues. But to quote the great Jordan Peterson, who is, of course, a psychiatrist, this is what he's been doing for 30 years, there is no, under, no other mental condition and body mis, dis, uh, dysmorphia is a mental it is a clinically listed mental condition. There is no other condition in medical science where we, quote unquote, affirm the condition. If, if you walk into a psychiatrist's office and say, I'm a schizophrenic, we don't say, that's great. Let's talk about your two personalities. When, when you go into a doctor's office and you say, I'm bulimic or, or, or anorexic, we don't affirm that and say, yes, you weigh 80 pounds, but you really are fat. Why is there only one condition, body dysmorphia, that medical science seems to say, yes, is okay. We are going to, quote unquote, affirm it. And we're also going to do medical procedures that go against the ancient Hippocratic Oath. First, do no harm. The idea that, you know, Matt Walsh has documented all of this. We are using drugs like Lupron that up to now has been used to chemically castrate sex offenders in prison. Lupron is now being used on young boys to, quote unquote, turn them into girls. You're not turning them into girls because you can't change the XY genetic chromosomal makeup of any human being. It doesn't matter what surgery you do, what hormone therapy yeah. you do, what drugs yeah. you buy. You will never, ever change the chromosomal makeup. A girl is XX, a boy is XY. So there's something deeper here, and, it, and it's really ideological. 
Okay, talk a little bit more about that because we recently experienced a, a tragedy in Colorado Springs where several people were killed in an LGBTQ friendly nightclub and many others were shot in the process. And the community is heartbroken, but the national media, the national narrative I've noticed that's forming around this is to cast blame on people who are calling attention to what you're talking about and then calling them, calling that hate. So right now, people are sensing, wow, if I speak up against this, then I'm going to be labeled a hater. And I don't know exactly what to do with that. Would you talk about that for a moment? Well, I'll just quote the Bible, that the truth will set you free. When is it a good thing to not stand by the truth? Every single day on my national radio show, America First, I say, whoever you are, wherever you live, whatever your job is, whatever age you are, the greatest thing you can do, not just for America, but for Western civilization, is stand by the truth. Never, ever censor yourself. Ne never bite your tongue just because you think uh, somebody won't like what you say because it is the truth. So w when it comes to the attack in Colorado Springs, it's, it's utterly reprehensible. I, I read the president's um, presidential statement that was published this weekend where he talks about the, the rising tide of anti-LGBTQIA+. And I, don't laugh at me. This is actually in the president's statement. Yeah. anti-LGBTQI+, uh, violence in America, especially, quote, especially against transgender black women. And I'm thinking, what? I mean, I, I live in America. My background is national security. I spent five and a half years in the Defense Department teaching counterterrorism and irregular warfare, spent two and a half years at Marine Corps University teaching counterterrorism. Then I was a strategist in the White House. So I'm pretty au fait with um, crime statistics and with, with you know, the handling of empirical data. There is, there is no such gross violation and rising... Uh, violence against black transgender women in America. And I find it quite shocking that there were no presidential statements issued after Waukesha when uh, an individual drives an SUV through the Christmas parade, uh, killing five adults and one young boy. And there's no presidential state. Let, let's, talk about, let's talk about real crime issues in America. The average weekend in Chicago sees 60 to 70 shootings and between 8 and 12 people killed, murdered every weekend. That's, that's you know, that's two uh, Q uh, bar nightclub killings every weekend in Chicago. But for some strange reason, there's no presidential statements issued every Monday morning uh, after the, the carnage in Chicago or Baltimore or anywhere else. And on top of that, let, let's talk about race and violence. The sad truth is, and my Salem colleague, Larry Elder, pointed this out for years, there are thousands of black young men killed every year in America. Last year, it was 9,000, which is more than were killed in 10 years of Vietnam. Can we just stop there for a second? More black young men were killed last year in America than were killed in Vietnam over 10 years. And who's killing them? Is it white supremacists? Is it adherents of Tucker Carlson? No, it's other black young men. Nine thousand. Where are the presidential statements on that? So what we have here, and you know, the great Andrew Breitbart taught us this uh, before he, he sadly left us. Culture is um, the, the primogenitor of, of, of politics. So politics is downstream from culture. And what we're seeing now is this ideological perversion of the truth for political ends. And conservatives look at this and say, ooh, I, I better not say anything um, at, at the coffee and cookies uh, uh, at, after mass on, on, on Sunday, or I, I better not talk about the truth about race and violence in America at the water cooler, because I'll get in trouble. I mean, is that really what Jesus taught us? Is that, is that really what our founding fathers stood for, to, to hide the truth? under a bushel because somebody who is politically motivated may take umbrage at the expression of the truth. That's, that's, that's the definition of cowardice. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's a very bracing explanation. I appreciate it. You know, we've, we, we do a lot of polling at summit. We usually work with the McLaughlin group and we found that about half the people who believe there is such a thing as truth say they don't ever say anything because they are afraid of being canceled. They are afraid of offending someone or they are afraid that they just won't know what to say. But in any event of all of the people who know the truth, half of them are not even showing up on the battlefield. Yeah. Yeah, so let, let's a couple of points here. So <laughs> when, when, when the, the secular um, moral relativists say there is no such thing as truth, they're actually cretins because that statement can't be true unless there is something such as truth. So you can't make a declarative statement there is no such thing as truth unless that statement is true. So you're, you're negating you know, a priori your own statement. You have to be an idiot to say there is no such thing as truth because that's a statement of objective truth itself. Secondly, and, and you know, we, we've got to get beyond very simplistic attitudes to how people relate to the truth. There, the, you know, Ben Shapiro, very popular with, with the younger crowd. Ben Shapiro has built his career ostensibly on, on one catchphrase, uh, feelings, the, uh, facts don't care about your feelings. Okay, but that's irrelevant. I mean, that, that statement may be true. Facts are independent of your feelings and feelings don't impact upon facts. Okay, but it is utterly irrelevant to the situation and the crisis we find ourselves in today with you know, young girls having double mastectomies because they think that will make them happy and turn them into boys. Yes, facts don't care about your feelings, but feelings matter. Mm -hmm. Feelings are massively important. Um, I have a three-hour daily radio show. I've written three books. I have a weekly TV show on Newsmax. And one thing I've realized in recent years is what's special about human beings. Yes, we're made in the image of our creator. Yes, we have a soul, unlike anything else that breathes and walks this earth. But there's something very fascinating that binds all of us. Whatever political persuasion we may hold, wherever we live in the world, whether we live in Africa, Asia, Europe, it doesn't matter. Human beings are fueled by stories. Uh, in politics, we have this awful phrase, narratives. You can say narratives, stories, or what have you. But, but why is it, and I, I see this with my children when they were little, why is it that, that both my son and my daughter needed every night to be told stories. My wife would read J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings to my son, who <laughs> now he's you know, addicted to that story and to the great movies. And my daughter, every night, and this was a little real challenge, would ask me to tell her a different story. And she'd give me a menu. She'd say, OK, tonight, Daddy, um, I want two princesses, three <laughs> dragons, a magic castle, and a wicked witch. And every night, you know, I'd have different parts of the jigsaw puzzle and I'd have to extemporize and I'd have to make a story based around tonight's menu. Why? Because it's not unique. That's not my daughter or, or my son. That's everybody's daughter. It's me as a child. Why is that? Because we need it. We, we crave stories, our feelings, how we understand eternal truths are mediated by stories. I mean, look at what, why Star Wars built upon the eternal stories that Joseph Campbell elucidated in The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Why is every story pretty much the same? A any good story has somebody who learns, somebody who's challenged, a reversal of fortune, an older person, a wiser person who, who advises them, some love interest. Why, why, why is that this, from ancient Greece you know, up to the Marvel Universe, why is that the same? Because it's, it's who we are. It's the fuel. that and It's how we internalize eternal truths through story making, whether it's Ovid and Homer or, you know, whether it's the latest Superman movie. So Ben is right. Shapiro's right. But he, he misses the point. People who believe in objective truth have to be able to communicate it in ways that touch the soul of the human being. I've been involved in conservative politics. You know, I, I grew up under Maggie Thatcher. I look at Ronald Reagan as, as a hero. I served in the Trump White House. And I look at conservative politics, and, and we just don't get it because 
will stand up there with a PowerPoint presentation and say, do you know, I can show you a graph that if you lower taxes, the government actually gets more tax revenue. Let me show you the, uh, the bell curve of the Laffer tax income. And like, yeah, death. I mean, as soon as you dump facts on an audience, it's like, you know, they're on their phone, <laughs> they're, they're looking up the latest meme. What's unique about Ronald Reagan and even my former boss is they knew the truth, but they communicated with such um, a fa faculty for, for connecting with the soul, for communicating through authentic frequencies. And that's what we have to do. We, we must talk the truth all the time, never censor ourselves, but connect with the listener at an emotional level. And, and that's, that's what a good preacher does. That's what a good priest does. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's a great foundation for the next question I wanted to ask you, which is getting back to, uh, so we understand humans are mammals, we're dimorphous. There are 6,500 biological differences between males and females. You cannot change your biology if you are a male to become a female or vice versa, in spite of the narratives that are that are out there. But I wonder sometimes, because I when I when I see, for example, a drag queen. I don't see them counteracting cultural stereotypes. I see them enacting and objectifying those cultural stereotypes. I see them making them worse or making them uh, more pronounced. And I, I wonder if we ought to just go back and sort of look at what is masculinity and femininity related to what is male and female, aside from cultural stereotypes getting back to those core principles that are part of who we are as humans. So I don't know if that forms a question or if it's just kind of the observation, but I'm curious what you think. Well, I, I look, I've, I'm now like episode six or episode seven into my daily show. Every uh, Friday, we, we uh, dedicate an hour to the manhood hour. Uh, we launched it with uh, Jack Carr, the, the author, the, the former SEAL, the author of the Terminal List. We've had Victor Davis Hanson. We've had some amazing guests, one of the founding members of, of Delta Force. And, and each of them answers the questions as to what is a man and, and where is the assault on masculinity coming from? So I, I point your, your listeners and your viewers to, to those manhood hours, where, wherever you get your podcast, Spotify or whatever, or you can, you can go to my website sebgorka.com if you want to see the videos but my response to you is i i, I would kind of have a cesura i i would ask at what point in time uh, are you saying drag queens don't destroy um archetypes they they reinforce them i would say 20 years ago uh, exactly i would say you know in britain there's a, the great tradition of pantomime every winter season you'd have plays you know the widow twanky and so forth where you know, a, a famous comedian would be dressed up in drag. They would play, you know, the aunt or whatever. And, and yes, I think there, seeing seeing a, a fat guy in a deep voice with a you know a beard and maybe a mustache play a quote unquote woman, you're actually you know for the kids they're laughing. It's funny, and you're reinforcing. Oh yeah, that's a guy in a dress. That's not a woman. So you're actually you know reinforcing the traditional archetypes. That's not the case anymore. I mean, you, you, you look at what these transgender drag events are doing today. This isn't hairy guys with beards. This is uh, often androgynous, sometimes very feminine men and women, uh, men with, with a lot of makeup, very feminine dresses. And, and to understand what's really going on, I, I, I doff my cap and I, I wish to recognize one of the people who's done the lion's share of the work on this issue, and that's uh, Professor James Lindsay. If you want to understand not only the transgender mission, but also critical race theory, critical legal theory, his book, Cynical Theories, this is a former professor of, of mathematics, he's a man of science, is absolutely crucial reading. His website, uh, New Discourses, likewise essential. If you just read one half a chapter, it's maybe three pages long, on queer theory in, in, in his book, Cynical Theories, you will understand what's really going on. 
queer theory, and he, he quotes the founders, the academic founders of queer theory from their own papers. This is, you know, the pregenitor of everything we're seeing today, saying our goal, quote unquote, is to make abnormal normal and to destroy the concept of normal. Our goal, and they use foul language, you know, to F, F with the concept of normal. If you yeah. understand that, you understand what's really going on in the, you know, Boston Children's Clinic at the drag queen events in, in, in Texas. This isn't having fun or having a laugh or temporarily, you know, twisting the archetypes. This is actually destroying the concept of normal because normal according to them, is oppressive. Saying a man is a man and a woman is a woman means you're a cisgender member of the oppressive white class. That's, that's really what's right. behind it. So I would say the transgender, and, and you see this, I mean, there's some amazing things happening. There's a, a woman, Posey Parker, who's one of the, the greatest um, fighter for women's rights in the, in the UK right now. She's the woman who's famous for putting up the billboards that were taken down that said woman equals adult female human. This was deemed to be politically incorrect. Wow. You know, she has identified, I had her on my show recently for an hour. Think of this for a second, Dr. Jeff. Why is it that, quote unquote, classic gays, you know, the, the, the gay men and women, the lesbians and homosexuals who fought for their gay rights in the 70s and 80s have a real problem with the transgender movement. I mean, th there is a, a massive fracture occurring inside the quote unquote LGBTQIA, LMNOP um, community because the, the old school homosexuals see in the transgender movement an assault on their identity. What one of the key aspects is, and you don't have to agree with it, but it's fascinating perspective. Gay men say that the transgender movement is targeting their identity. Why? Most of the young boys who are being given Lupron, who are being put in dresses, who are having surgeries done on their nether regions, would in fact grow up to be gay men. Mm -hmm. And their gay identity is being negated, is being you know, clear, deleted by the transgender extremists. Now, that, that tells you more about what this is all about. This is about negating any concept of truth because homosexuality has been around since, you know, in, in perpetuity, since human society. This transgender movement isn't about asserting identity. It's about denying objective reality and even old school homosexuals get it. Well, yes, it doesn't. It seems pretty obvious that if you can teach boys and girls to look at one another and say there is no difference, right? Then you can convince them of anything, right? But let's talk about the ma let's talk about masculinity for a minute, and I, I we're going to put that in the show notes, of course, about your show America First, and uh, let people check out the the um, the, man. Call it the man the man hour. Okay, all right, but let's talk about that for a little bit. Talk about masculinity. What are the core principles of masculinity? How would a boy know that he is a man? Yeah. Aside from the stereotypes of he has sex, he smokes a cigarette, he drinks, breaks the law, you know, whatever. All right. So let, let me share with you a, a, a little personal uh, vignette. My, my son is 23 uh, recently. Um, told me that he's in the middle of a you know four hour long discussion over cigars he said he's very grateful for one thing in particular that i provided him which is boundaries he needed to know boundaries how far you can go what is allowed what is permissible and what is impermissible so number one knowing boundaries and setting boundaries the idea that you could do whatever you want is the antithesis to being a mature man secondly and this came to me uh, as i was launching the manhood hour as i was talking to my son the applicability of violence and i don't mean being a tough guy i mean 
being a man, and you learn this from your father, or if, if, you, if your father's not the role model, then it's your uncle, it's, it's the football coach, it's somebody. Somebody has to show you. This is why, you know, gay adoption doesn't make sense, because something is missing. It is the role of the male father figure, whoever it is, to, through osmosis, through demonstration, show to the young man and the boy when violence is justified and when it isn't justified. It's not, you can do it whenever. I mean, why is it there's these mass shootings that Biden et al. wants to say are, 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 are because of inanimate objects? So the AR-15 magically you know, kills uh, people by itself. Why is it so often 22, 21-year-old men? Hmm. There, there, there's a reason there. And I guarantee you, it's because if they don't have a, a, a psychiatric problem that is demonstrable, it's because there never was a real father figure who said, this is when violence is okay, and this is when violence is not okay. That is perhaps the greatest thing you can do for your son is to teach them the role of violence. Why? Because men are bigger and stronger. It is our job to protect. The number one job of a man is to provide and protect. Women cannot do that. I'm sorry, as long as you've got a womb and you can become pregnant, and pregnancy takes nine months, you cannot be the hunter-gatherer protector. It is just a biological fact of life. And the last thing in terms of that, that is perhaps the deeper, and this goes to the transgender child abuse that's occurring right now, the role of a man is also to protect the vulnerable. A civilization will be measured by whether or not it protects the vulnerable. And Obviously, that is the aged, that is children, and the unborn. We will be judged, finally, on Judgment Day by our Lord and Savior, based upon how we treated and stood up for the vulnerable. The idea that children right now are being mutilated in the name of medicine, and we're not stopping. It's like my, my buddy, Charlie Kirk, uh, also my, my Salem colleague, he, he gave this amazing speech at an evangelical event, I think, maybe four months ago, with regards to the um, the fake female swimmer, uh, Thompson, Thomas, or uh, yeah. Pe Pennsylvania University. And he asked this, he got all emotional. He was, he was on a stage with, with, with a moderator, and he said, where are the fathers? Where are the fathers? I mean, my, my children were D1 and D3 athletes all through high school and college. And the idea that my daughter could be a college or high school swimmer gets to a race that could determine her future career in academics, in college and in sports. And up walks this guy who was ranked 245th in high school male swimming has no surgery, grows his hair, pretends he's a girl, and suddenly he, you know, he jumps, oh no, sorry, it's 423rd. He jumps from 423rd nat na national ranking as a boy to first in the country, and he's allowed to compete. And, and Charlie asked, you know, when, when you have that meet, when the parents are there, every father of the biological girls should walk up to the swimming pool, make a human wall, and say, that man does not compete against our daughters. That's yeah. not that's not you know aggressive. It is a, a a protection of the truth and a protection of the vulnerable. And men will be measured by whether or not they are prepared to protect the vulnerable. Mm. So, st standing for truth, fighting against injustice, being willing to be the 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 warrior, defender, protector all crucial aspect of that. And there's a, you know, it's interesting. There's a nurturing aspect to what you're talking about too. You think of a, a young woman and how much more confident she could be yeah. if she had a father who would be willing to stand up for her in that way. My, my, this is my, pro woman. Say that my, my, my wife yesterday um, is now pondering her, her, the next stage of her career. She was very successful political appointee in the Trump administration. She ran a think tank. Uh, on counterterrorism before that, then she went to the Heritage Foundation, and now she wants to write a book, and, and she wants to explain 
what happened to her as a child and how she got to understand the importance of objective truth and conservative values. And one of the things she said to me last night, and I hope she, she won't have issues with me sharing this, is when she was, her parents were divorced at the worst time. T 10 years old is when you create the most uh, psychological damage to a child if you get divorced. And after that point in time, she said, I had no protector. Hmm. I had no protector at home when my father was not in the home. That's your job. That's your job yeah. as a father. Yeah. Wow. Well, this has been a great discussion. I am really grateful for the Manhood Hour, uh, for your bringing up these topics, for causing us, and we're going to be doing more shows on this in the future, really going back to the idea of manhood and womanhood and thinking of it from God's perspective. What was it he was doing when he designed us the way he did? Rather than rejecting it and embracing a fantasy world, as you mentioned earlier, you know, knowing the truth and the truth will set you free from all of that. So thanks so much for coming on the show today. I'm really grateful. Thank you. And please uh, check out the Manhood Hour. It's the America First radio show. And uh, my latest um, web page is my sub stack where you can find actual transcripts of the Manhood Hour. So that's my name in one word. Sebastian Gorka, G-O-R-K-A, Sebastian Gorka, dot substack dot com. And thank you for having me, Dr. Jeff. Yeah, Dr. Sebastian Gorka, thank you for being on the show. God bless. I want to say thank you to my guest, Dr. Sebastian Gorka, for joining me on the show today to talk about the crisis of masculinity. You can find out about Dr. Gorka's show. It's called America First on the Salem Network. America First with Dr. Sebastian Gorka and especially on Fridays where he has the Manhood Hour. I think you might find that especially interesting. Listen, this topic is hugely important. We need to be people who recognize the truth and speak out. That's been a constant theme. You heard it once again today. Thank you for joining on today's episode of the show. Listeners, I want you to know that our podcast is on Edify, which is a truly powerful app that brings together thousands of the best Christian podcasts in one place for your listening enjoyment. You can download it at edify, E-D-I-F-I dot app. Be sure to share this show if you have enjoyed listening to it and leave a review if you would on the site where you download the show. That helps more people know about the Dr. Jeff Show. And I'll look forward to seeing you next week.